again, a new branch of international law. Uh, law of airspace, it has started to flourish as a result of discoveries, of course, after he may have started its uh, actions to reach the space and do developments related to that. So Second World War and the aftermath is a time when human beings have started to think about regulating the relations related to space. The first question is, where is space? Where it is is known, of course. What we don't know is that the precise limits, where it definitely starts from. We know that airspace starts from the bottom where we put our feet on. And it goes upwards until somewhere. It doesn't have a legal definition, actually. It almost has. The thing is that we know that there are certain, actually, um, attempts to clarify where all those limits are. Did I hand in you the attempts? I did not write. Sorry. Okay. Okay, um, where outer space starts is, that's a good point. Stratosphere can be one of the limits, and this is most of the time how it is referred to. The thing is that the thickness of the stratosphere changes. Therefore, we cannot give specific kilometers, feet, to tell where the airspace ends and the outer space starts. Uh, among those debates, I have also come across this claim saying that space is where the gravity comes to an end. Another one says that after atmosphere comes to an end, it is space that it starts. And the last one I have come across and personally I find most meaningful, it is where the efficient control of the state ends. This is something directly related to the radars, of course. If the radars, I have shown you some footages of stratosphere flights, and those stratosphere flights cannot be easily determined, found out, notified by the radars. But if the radars can perceive it, then this is under the efficient control of the sovereign state, right? So the limits, your friend was right, stratosphere is the most common claim, but legally we don't have a precise definition of the limits of the airspace. So, what we know is that international uh, law tells us that outer space is res communis or terra communis. What does that mean? All states can use it as they wish in a beneficial way, not in, a, in an unfriendly way. So space belongs to everybody. All states have equal sovereign rights, or no state has sovereignty, and all states can benefit from the regime, uh, from the outer space. Well, when was the moon visited for the first time? In which year? 69, that's true. Now, we come across with a treaty right before it has happened, dated back to 67. It is a long name. Uh, by the way, for law of air, you have learned two sources. For law of space, you'll be learning two sources as well. This is a long name, but if you are calling it as 67 treaty on outer space, moon and other celestial bodies, that's enough for me, then I can know that you're knowledgeable about this treaty, okay? Uh, and the aim, why there was a necessity to establish such a treaty? There was a necessity to establish such a treaty because both blocks in the world were making efforts to reach the space. And both of the parties were afraid if the other party goes there and claims sovereignty on the moon, for instance. Or what if they establish nuclear explosives to the orbit of the world? What if they establish, um, uh, what if they 
install certain weapons of mass destruction, for instance, or other military devices to the moon so that they can simply enter the coordinates in the world and shoot wherever they want. So this was a huge concern, and those concerns were brought up in the United Nations General Assembly, and the UN has started formulating an agreement which can be acceptable for all blocs so that everybody feels same uh, and safe under this treaty. So 67 treaty uh, was open to signature and it says that any of those celestial bodies or moon or space that cannot be taken under national appropriation, this means no one can claim sovereignty. I have gone to the moon for the first time, therefore it belongs to me. If you look at the moon, then you have to pay taxes to me. You cannot use the light of the moon. Well, of course, this was not the uh, concern. The concern was if they go there and install weapons. But anyhow, the thing is that no one can claim sovereignty over the moon, over the planets, if they go there. This is most important and the foremost article of this is seven treaty. Does it include Sources, natural sources, in, for example, asteroids and other... Yes, yes, everything. That's true. <coughs> and, okay, national appropriation is not allowed. What is allowed is that since, as long as it is res communis, uh, the thing is that if nations can reach those celestial bodies or moon, they can land in, they can take samples, they can conduct experiments. They can conduct research. So they can do anything beneficial for the human beings. But they cannot give harm. They can't do anything against UN Charter. So they cannot endanger peace and security. Well, UN Charter only calls for international peace and security. Perhaps that word has to be replaced one day by galactical peace and security. We'll see that at the moment it's only said international, so worldly uh, peace and security. And anything against those uh, UN Charter articles cannot be done in the space. And here we do not come across with any kind of limits in between where the airspace ends and where the outer space begins. We don't have it. And it prohibits installment of nuclear weapons to the uh, orbit. Military device cannot be brought. M uh, weapons of mass destruction cannot be brought to the space. But military personnel can't go there actually, to International Space Station for instance. Perhaps some people from military are also allowed to get there without their weapons, first of all. Secondly, they cannot install any kind of uh, destructive materials there. Or satellites can be sent to the orbit, however, they cannot be carrying any kind of explosives on them. Jurisdiction is another thing. What if crimes happen there? Well, there are crimes and there are damages. There is a difference, of course. If crimes are happening, then we turn to the nationalities of the perpetrators of the crime, for instance. So if we are moving towards private law, then we have to turn to the nationals of the perpetrator of the crime. And if the nation is ready to assume jurisdiction, well, I don't know any examples of transnational crimes there in the space, but illicit trafficking, human trafficking, if that should happen, then we can talk about universal jurisdiction, of course. And um, if damages are given to other devices, satellites, you know, they require a lot of resources, they're expensive, they require a lot of know-how, huge number of um, technical personnel working on them, and shooting them to the space is another huge effort. And at the end, if a damage is given, what's going to happen was another question mark, and this was solved by the 72 agreement about international liability 
for damage caused by space objects. So what if the satellite of India hits to the Turkish satellite and gives a huge harm? What's going to happen? Was a jurisdiction question. You have already studied state responsibility. So the agents of the state, if they uh, cause any kind of act of tort, if a damage happens, then the liability to repair that damage rises, right? This is still the case in the space as well. If a damage is given either by the agent of the state or by the device of the state, then the state assumes responsibility to pay uh, reparations and to uh, improve the situation once again. So, once we start studying law of outer space, the space, its nature, and how to regulate it legally gains importance. This is the first thing that we learned. We have said that it's res communis, so it can only be used for beneficial reasons. Then we turn to the uh, human being sent and devices sent to the moon, and not to the moon, to the space actually, and we learn that there are certain jurisdiction rights of the state still in this space, first of all. Second, the state responsibility is still another subject uh, that's still valid. And um, what else have I mentioned? They're abandoned from carrying weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, military devices, and so on. The activities can be done in the space is also regulated by this regime. So we have said that taking samples, conducting research, conducting experiments are okay as long as they're not giving harm to UN charter and so on. Uh, is there any big authority when you send an object to the space, we need like an authority to get a permission? Uh, to get a permission, yeah, international for, permission, no. it does not example, exist. If, if Turkey wants to send some uh, like object to the space, it no, all nations can benefit uh, yeah. from that equal. It is just like sending a ship to international waters. Okay. Therefore, it's not necessary. So the activities that can be done in the space is also regulated by this regime. So the activities starting from world towards space is regulated. And authorities are saying that what is missing is the vice versa one. Those activities starting from the uh, universe towards world, it is not regulated. And perhaps if human beings can get in touch with the aliens and if we notice certain actions towards world, perhaps uh, that also needs to be regulated. That's a huge question mark, how that can be done. Therefore, we hear nowadays people talking about galactic diplomacy and so on. <laughs> I'm just mentioning it so that I mean, that you have heard of it, at least in this class. Uh, this is a part of international law that's still expanding. At the moment, we're talking about nations moving to Mars or settling there, but we have said that sovereignty cannot be claimed. So question marks are approaching. Unregulated areas are a lot. And perhaps in the future, such conducts can also create diplomatic problems. And we don't have ready-made answers for such questions. Do you have any questions, by the way, related to the law of space? Yes, Bato. Uh, when uh, the Americans planted a flag on the moon, was that perceived as an expression of sovereignty? No, that was just the national pride saying that we have landed here, but they have never claimed that this is our piece of territory. And if someone has to come here, they have to take ask for visas and pay taxes. That has never happened. So that was just national pride. Okay. <laughs> How was that? I said like a wall for Mexicans. <laughs> True. Could be the case. What else? I've seen some hands, I guess. No? If you don't have any questions, that's all about uh, law of air and law of space. Then I'll move to uh, settling international disputes in our next class. 
So make sure that you have understood everything related to that. Yes. Uh -huh. Send something. For instance, if the device he sends gives harm to the satellite of Turkey, then he has to, the US, United States, does not assume responsibility. He has to assume the responsibility with his company like that. So. If he's using the basis of the US government to start its uh, flight, then yes. If he is using his own private places to start, then he doesn't need to. to. Yes? Before seeing uh, that uh, laws um, provide equality in outer space to all nations, uh, I was going to say, uh, uh, I was predicting that, that uh, laws only allowing states that can reach uh, outer space uh, to do experiments. True. So I was going to make Mark's argument, but seeing that uh, all hmm. states are uh, provided with equality, uh, I want to make another uh, argument uh, that still uh, supports that laws do not provide equality. Uh, they just do it in legal ways, but not in practi practical ways. Because True. we know that uh, many countries do not have the technology uh, available to reach outer space and conduct experiments. But mm. for example, developed states can um, do any research and exploit the resources in outer space. So. Even if all states are equal uh, on uh, principle, uh, since many states cannot uh, exercise that equality right, I think um, laws uh, still uh, reflect a um, point where we can do Marxist uh, analysis, uh, arguments on. Because That's true. the uh, so-called term tragedy of commons is here. If it is open to all, then one powerful state or some powerful states uh, will establish their power on space and exploit all resources. Related to that, there are bridges in Istanbul that are conducting two pieces of Istanbul to each other. Are they open to everybody? Does that set any limits? Who can pass, who cannot pass? They have regulations on what, which types of people can pass. Mm -hmm. and Related to vehicles then. <laughs> It is actually not an equal implementation because it asks for money. So those that can pay for it can pass through the bridges as well. So it is all around actually. But then we have to make considerations related to economic considerations and equality principle. And that's a huge area of friction. That's right. But uh, related to the question, like before space, there's so many areas that we <laughs> or Marx but this looks like a more technical non-political uh, issue but I, I argue that even such technical issues uh, technological or uh, hard science issues are also heavily influenced by politics he's preparing perhaps some gaps for his doctoral st uh, studies <laughs> you know something that's definitely not studied until now good point then if you don't have any further questions enjoy the rest of your day